All right, well, let's get started. This is week four, and I want to continue with some chapter two material. Just three, three things I want to talk about that we didn't cover last week, and that is the concept of arguments, specifically inside of a UGen function, uh, which give us real-time control uh, in terms of being able to change the sound while it's playing. Uh, envelopes and uh, a very closely associated and super collider specific concept called done actions. So these are you know, sort of like ADSR, amplitude envelopes, all, in all different kinds. And then finally the concept of synthdef and synth, which are two classes which we've been using indirectly, but then we'll start using them explicitly. <clears throat> so as an example, boot the server here, I, I took a, a, one, of the, one of several UGen functions we made last week and just kind of modified it a little bit. Uh, so this is, um, we have a unit generator, it's an oscillator called varsaw, which is a uh, variable duty triangle wave slash sawtooth wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, we're doing multi-channel expansion here so that it produces uh, two channels of audio, one a varsaw at 300 hertz and the other channel at 301. The width parameter, I'll show you what that means in just a second. Mm -hmm. And then ooh, let's get rid of this, we're jumping ahead. So this is the, the version I wanted to present sort of right off the bat. Just scaling down the amplitude and it sounds like this. And I think I showed this release option at the end of, of yeah, just a, yeah, you know, we'll see that it's, it's, um, it works because there's a bunch of stuff that happens. Yeah, release works because there's, there's a bunch of stuff that happens behind the scenes that we're not aware of. But anyway, so this is, uh, let's, let's just pull this into um, our uh, arguments section here to, to begin talking about arguments. The, uh, the context in which we'll begin is, is, by, is the observation that this unit generator function will do exactly the same thing every time. We, we turn it on, it sounds, uh, and then we can, you know, we can turn it off. But that, that's really all we can do with it right now, other than going in and manually changing a bunch of numbers. And, and, but, you know, if we, if we want this uh, sound to, you know, if we want it to be playing, and then the frequency changes, and then the amplitude changes, we want to be able to sort of play with it as it's going, sort of a... Uh, yes, and so we can, we can do that by creating an argument to represent one of the parameters that we want to change. Um, let's, let's say uh, the width, for example. Why don't we start there? So we're going to declare an argument. Um, I'll just do WTD, uh, and we'll set it equal to 0.9. And then instead of hardwiring the width parameter in the varsaw to always be 0.9, we're going to say use our argument. WDT. <clears throat> and we can play this and it'll sound exactly the same. But now that we've given ourselves an argument, we now have the option to use set messages to uh, talk to the active sound process while it's running and change it. So that would, look, we can prepare a set message. Uh, we. We, we want to talk to the process that is actually playing, which we've called x. And we just need to give it two comma-separated items. One is a symbol, which is uh, the name of the argument we've declared, and then the new value. And uh, we're actually going to, let's, let's actually, I'm going to play this, and then I'm going to open up the scope so we can actually see the waveform so we'll be able to see and hear what actually happens here. So, and I'm just going to prepare s.scope over here. So we'll play this, open the scope. Yes, that is the default value, 0 0.9. Uh, and what we see is like basically a, a sawtooth wave. You know, it's a, like this. Um, yeah, we'll put this up here, put this down here for a second. And, uh, And now we can change the width to 0.5 and, and we'll watch what happens. Yeah, change it to 0.4. Yeah. So VAR saw is an oscillator which when width is 0.5, it's a perfect triangle wave. 
and then moving the width to zero or to one will basically slant the wave so that it turns into a sawtooth wave. And as a consequence of that, the timbre changes. So we can have a basically blend from triangle to sawtooth timbre, which is kind of fun. So that's, uh, and, then, and then we can turn this off whenever we're done. So that is the, the very simplest version of what we can do here. Uh, let's, uh, let's add a few more arguments. Um, so we can, we can add any of these here. Let's make an amplitude value. And uh, we're, we're not really allowed. There's a couple of um, you know, subtle things you're allowed to do and not do when we declare arguments inside of a, a function that's meant to be played. We can't do uh, math. I, I'm pretty sure this, this will be, I, I think this will throw an error. No, it doesn't throw an error, but I, I'm worried it won't behave correctly. I, I've, I know I've encountered situations where, uh, where I've seen the default value for an argument be expressed as a mathematical expression. And I, I think that's um, problematic. So what we should do is just um, put a sensible value in for, for, uh, for some value, and you know, just, just like this. Uh, I, I happen to know that negative 20 when converted to amplitude is 0.1. So these are, you know, it's the same uh, quantity of, of loudness, of, of level. So now we have this, and we can change the width, and we can change the amplitude to be a little louder or a little quieter. And here we can totally do all sorts of mathematical expressions. So we can, uh, you know, set it. Oh, this will, this will be the, we'll go up to, I don't know, 15, down to 25. Right? And we can also set multiple arguments with a single statement. Um, so, for example, we can set the amplitude to be louder and set the width to be closer to a sawtooth shape. So this line right here, this is an example of setting multiple parameters in one statement. Okay. And, you know, we could continue here and, and make an argument for the frequency. And we have sort of a, um, a couple of ways we can do this. It, it is possible to make an argument into an array. Let's see that way first. So we'll say freak equals. Now here, I think uh, this may not work correctly. We'll see. Uh, seems OK with that. Oh, no, but it doesn't play. See? I, here's, I think we need to put a hash symbol here. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So it's unexpected. If you want to declare arguments in a unit generator function and you want one of them to be an array, uh, you must precede the array with the hash symbol, which makes this array a literal array. There's a reference file called literals, and I think if we search for array, um, yeah, this basically the 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 core of the problem here. The, the reason this is done this way is because in a UGen function that is you know meant to be played and make sound the channel size of every signal must be fixed. So you, you can't, for example, dynamically, uh, you can't make a, a synth that function with an argument for the number of channels in a signal. Like you can't sort of dynamically change that from two to four to eight or something like that. And that's something similar is going on here because um, these arguments are, it's not, re these aren't really numbers. They look like they're numbers, but they're actually audio signals. And so we need to use this hash symbol to, to make this uh, uh, a, basically an array that is as unique and permanent and unchangeable as an integer is. Uh, it's, that's my, the best way I can sort of think to explain it. So now if we do this, we then can do set commands for the frequency. But I don't think the array in the set command has to be uh, a literal array. One number where? So if you want to set the frequency and 
right now the argument is an array. Yeah. But there you said you only have like one number. If I were to plug only one number in here, I'm not exactly sure what would happen. Oh, uh, I would have to do it. To, uh, one, my, my guess, if I were to plug in one number here, let's go ahead and try it. Maybe we'll take only one. I guess it would, it would supplant the, the first item in the array. Let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I think I was working with 330 earlier, and that's why I, so we get this nice kind of, uh, kind of, you know, but then I, I, my brain <laughs> decided to just make it out of tune. Uh, so th this is an option. So if you want to do array arguments, this is, this is one way you can do it, and then you would, you know, I guess I'll, I'll save this line just for posterity. Uh, yeah, so note that we don't need the hash symbol here. It wouldn't hurt, I don't think. I'm pretty sure it's totally fine. Yeah. But you don't, you don't necessarily need it. Uh, the, another, another design choice, something which I, I would probably, I generally don't really like array arguments. I, sometimes they're necessary, but I tend to find a workaround. So what we might do is um, something a little bit different and uh, just, just set a base frequency like this. And then here, instead of just plugging in the argument for freak, uh, we would do uh, freak uh, plus the array 0, 1. OK, so it's, we, need to, we need to take a step back and make sure we understand what's going on here. So you know, if, if freak were just a number, it, it kind of is here, but not really. But it's close enough. If we, you know, this expression, you remember the behavior of adding an integer to an array of integers. The operation is applied to every item. So yeah, so same thing happens here. We have a signal, which is basically a, a constant but changeable uh, 330. And that gets added to this array. And so we get a, an array of two signals, which are a constant but changeable 330 and 331. So this, this is also fine. And, then, and let, me, let, me, let me change the, um, the amount of beating. And again, we could, we could make an argument for this number one and, and make it a, you know, let's, let's do a three so it's a little bit more audible. <clears throat> and then we can uh, set the frequency like this. Let's bring this down here. So now we only have to set one value, and the multi-channel binaural beating thing is kind of baked into the algorithm. So there's different ways to do it. But the bottom line is that if we want to be able to dynamically change the sound while it's playing, you have to declare an argument. And I just let me make like, something else uh, clear here. I'm going to do a couple of things. Let's first of all put a 0 at the end. So this is going to silence the, the sound completely because when you play a UGen function, we're, Super Collider is going to try to produce a signal from the very last expression. And in this case, it's just putting zeros out at the, uh, I guess, audio rate. Uh, so this is just a way of disabling playback. In, in a very, you can always just comment this out and you've got sound again. Right. Uh, and what I'm going to do is say freak.source dot post ln. So source is a method which is defined for every object, and most of them just return themselves in response to source. So if we say two dot source, we get two. If we say the string high dot source, we get the string high. So don't don't really don't put too much thought into this. But if we, uh, I'm gonna uh, change this x to an f. So this is our function. We're just making a function here. You know, it's got eugens in it, so it looks like it's supposed to produce sound. If we just um, evaluate this function, treating it like a normal language side function, just not pretending it doesn't have anything to do with sound, just trying to get a value out of it. Uh, if we do this, uh, there's a couple of things we see in the post window. This green zero with the arrow symbol. This is just a side effect of the, you know, the fact that whenever we evaluate any code in Super Collider, the result of the last statement is always posted. So we don't really care about this too much. But this 330 
is the result of this line here. It, it says, free, give me the source of freak and then post that. And when we value a function like we're doing here, these arguments are exactly what they look like. So 330 is, is an integer. I think if we say dot class dot post ln, we should get integer here. Yeah. So this, this 330, when we value the function instead of dot play, this is actually the integer 330. But now what I'm going to do is play f instead. And we're not going to hear any sound because it ends with a 0. But instead of 330, oh, you know what? Let me get rid of this class. Yeah. Instead of, so just, just for comparison, I'll, I'll do these both, just for extra, extra clarity. And here's a function. If we use value, freak is the integer 330. If we play it, it's an instance of a class called control, which is a, a type of audio signal. It's a type of unit generator that we generally don't create ourselves. You can even go to the help file for control, and in the first paragraph it says, typically controls are created from the arguments of a synthdef function. And this phrase, synthdef function, you can just pretend that says ugen function. Right? So this is an important thing to keep in mind because it is a gotcha in a lot of circumstances where you're like, wait a minute. I, you know, I, in fact, I have a, a mini tutorial video called using if in a synthdef. And that's one of the main gotchas where like, you're trying to do what looks like totally normal, legitimate mathematical operations with arguments in a synthdef function. And you get these huge complicated error messages because when we play this function, freak is not actually, all of these arguments are not actually integers and floats. They are signals. And signals can change. And so we, for example, don't know if the frequency is greater than or less than 500 at any given point in time. That's, that's a thing that has to happen in real time. So anyway, this, these are, this is kind of like technical, technical babble about stuff like this. But, so let, let me try to get back to some of the more practical things here. Uh, so we, we've got some arguments. And uh, there's a couple different ways that you can express arguments in a UGen function. Uh, you can. Let's copy this and move it down a little bit. Uh, so we've already seen in functions that instead of the arg, we can do a set of pipes with no semicolon. Right? This is exactly the same thing. Let me pull uh, these down here as well. Okay, so this is totally fine. Uh, oh, right, and I, I got rid of the play message, so I'll put that back there. We'll call this x. Right. This exactly the same thing we just did, except a different syntactical style, pipes instead of arg. And there is actually a third way to do arguments in a in a synthdef or in a in a ugen function. And you, it's most of the documentation in the help browser uses one of these two styles, either arg or the pipes. So if you, for further reading, you can go to sc-synth.org, and if you go to resources and sort by views. The most popular post here is, is one uh, by, I think, um, yeah, Nathan Ho posted this. Uh, basically, there's a syntax shortcut, which is an alternative to doing this approach here. And I'll, I'll walk you through it. I, I do recommend reading this. It's really well written. And there are some significant advantages to this way. So, so basically, we're just going to get rid of these. Uh, well, I'll, I won't get rid of it. I'll, I'll copy and paste one more time. Right. Right, so we're, gonna, we're not going to do that at all. Right? Just getting rid of the argument statement in the way we just saw. And instead, so here, of course, this isn't going to work, because now we're going to get a bunch of like variable not defined things, because we're, we're using these keywords that have not been sufficiently you know, uh, declared. So what we can do is we make it a symbol. We add the desired rate. Um, so this can be AR, KR, IR. Uh, and, and even uh, TR is an option as well for trigger type arguments. We'll hopefully get into that when we get into envelopes. And then in parentheses, the default value that we want. Right? And this is all we need to effectively declare an argument running at a specific rate and given a default value. 
And so we'll do the same thing with width. We make it a symbol, uh, use the control rate, and give it a default width of 0.9. Same thing with amp. Uh, and here is one of the uh, immediate tangible benefits of this approach is that we actually can do math inside of these default value parentheses. Um, I think that's one of, the, one of the advantages that Nathan talks about on that post. So this should work just fine. Oops. Grab another one of these from up here, something like this. So it's still working, still doing its thing. Uh, oh, I, I pasted it in the wrong spot. I didn't mean to do that. Put it uh, down here. Right. Uh, so there, there's a couple of you know, advantages, like sort of clarity. The fact that symbols get text colorized makes them stand out a little bit more because with something like, you know, uh, I mean, it's a little bit clouded because I'm also using these keyword identifiers, which also get turned green. So, but um, again, I'll just I'll just refer. If you want to understand why I think this is advantageous, you can read Nathan's blog post. And, uh, I think the last thing I want to do is uh, address the very reasonable question of okay, how do we can we make these parameters like interpolate or change from one value to the next, not instantaneously, but actually you know, glissando, amplitude fades, things like that, actually, you know, continuously moving from one value to the next instead of instantaneously, and we can do it. And I'll, I'll show you um, how we can do that using these two different styles. So we'll take this one with the pipe style, and uh, what we do here is we've declared these arguments, and if we declare them this way, they're just control rate signals, uh, which change pretty much instantaneously whenever we set them. If you want to have a glissando effect, for example, we go to the frequency argument where it is deployed in the synth def, or in the, in the ugen function, and we say dot lag, and then we provide a lag time in seconds. This is the simplest way. There's a lot of variations on lagging, but this is kind of the, the sort of simplest simplest and least flexible way. And what this means is every time the value of freak changes, it will take 0.2 seconds to get to its target value from its current value. So here's what that sounds like. Okay, you can hear that glissando. Yeah, so the same thing is true for amp. This is another useful parameter to lag. Let's make it like a, a nice long three second lag. And so this is still 0.2 seconds. And then we'll say, set the amp to 0.01. Back up. Which means that we can also give that lag number an argument. Yes, that is correct. You can also declare an argument to modulate or modify the lag time itself. And you could make, you know, freak lag over here and amp lag over here. Uh, the one variable that I do like is um, instead of lag, you can say uh, var lag. And uh, with var lag, you provide a the first, the first value provided to var lag is the time interval over which interpolation takes place, and then also a curvature value, which by default is zero, which will produce linear behavior. Um, and then if you change the curvature to some positive value, then the lag will change slowly at first, and then quickly towards the end of that duration, and negative values do the opposite. So let's, let's make this um, one second with a curvature of zero, and listen to what this sounds like, this linear change. Um, let's, let's start it off at, uh, oh, that's fine, let's do this. Right, here we go. So it's linear behavior. Uh, and then we'll release that. If we make the curvature um, positive eight, now I think it'll go, nah, 
it'll zip up right at the end. No. So the positive numbers result in a change which is initially slow and fast at the end. Negative eight. This one I think sounds a lot better. This is like a lot of like kind of a pop music flavor, like the way like a lot of synths behave. You know? well, let's make it even more extreme. Let's do like, uh, yeah, negative 20. Yeah. yeah, so that's, this is like more musically intuitive because when we change a note, we want it to hit that note pretty soon. Like that note should happen now-ish, but a, like a fast glissando. So negative numbers work well as lag times. Regular lag doesn't give you this curvature option, but var lag does. Um, so there's a, there's a section in chapter two, changing a sound while playing, which kind of recaps a lot of this stuff. But that is, that is essentially all I wanted to do with arguments in a synth def function. So declare as many as you like, use whatever style feels right to you, and lag them if you want interpolating change. Um, okay, let's talk, let's talk envelopes. Uh, an envelope is uh, a signal, which unlike uh, an oscillator or noise generator, which is you know, stochastic or deterministic, uh, an envelope is uh, user customizable. Sort of any shape, finite duration, can be sustained at a point uh, indefinitely, uh, can be long, can be short, can be really any, any value you like. <clears throat> so let's, let me grab this starting function again, pull it down here. Um, okay, so here we have, yeah. So let's, let's start talking about envelopes by introducing a class called env. Env is a language side object. So it, it's not a signal. It doesn't really know anything about sound. It's just a, a, an object which allows us to specify a breakpoint envelope shape. So let's make one. Uh, env does not have a literal representation the way integers and things like that do, so we say env.new and store the results in a new um, variable or container. There are um, three things which I find myself always specifying in an env object, and all three of them are arrays. The first is an array of values or levels. These are the actual points in time quantities which the envelope signal will reach as the envelope performs itself. So let's do something simple and say 0, 1, 0. So this, uh, you know, we can, let's, let's do a nice luxurious, lux luxuriously spaced version so we can very clearly see what's going on. So our levels array is 0, 1, 0. That means this envelope, when it becomes a signal, will start at a value of 0, go to one somehow over some duration, and then go back to zero. Next, we have times. These are values in seconds, which represent the durations between levels. So this array should have a size that is one less than the levels array. So let's say 0.5 and then 2. And then third is an array of curve values. And I introduced var lag earlier uh, intentionally, so that this concept will be pretty clear. It's the same idea. Zero is linear. Positive values are slow than fast. Negative values are fast than slow. So let's make the uh, uh, first segment sort of jump up pretty quickly, and let's make the second segment uh, do the same thing, but not quite so aggressively. Okay, so there we go. We've created an env named E, and one of the first things we can do with this env is plot it. And there we go. There is our lovely two-segment, three-level env. Starts at zero, uses a curvature of four over half a second to get up to the value of one, and then a curvature of negative one. Or sorry, I meant to say curvature of negative four. I might have said four. And a curvature of negative one for here. So you can see this one is almost linear, but it's a little bit bent. Right? Uh, so that's, that's really all there is to making an env. The next main step is to incorporate it into a synthdef function. So let's use this env as an amplitude envelope. Um, so we'll take this and 
we are going to make another variable called env. And I'm going to show you how to do this in, in two different ways. The, the first way is the way that you will most likely see in all the help files. It's a little bit more verbose. It's more, more typing, not a ton more typing, but more. And then I'll show you a, a syntax shortcut for doing the same thing. So env has a, a sibling, sort of a partner in crime class called envgen. This is a unit generator. Uh, it's like the server-side version of um, the env class. It's the one that takes an env, transforms it into a signal. So here's a, you know, envgens, I think that most commonly you will run these at the control rate because you generally don't need audio rate precision, but sometimes you do, especially for really, really, really short envelopes, like crispy, crunchy, percussive things. Um, so it's never really a bad idea to run an envgen at the audio rate, but sometimes you don't really need it. For this one, which has durations which are pretty long in the grand scheme of the envelope world, uh, control rate would be fine. Audio rate would be fine too, but we're not going to hear a difference between the two in this case. So in this envgen, we need a couple of things. First, we need an instance of env. And we already have that, so we can just, we could use e, but I'm, you know, I'd, I'm going to just copy the env straight into the envgen like this. All right, and we'll stop there. We'll come back because we have some issues to deal with. But this envgen has all the information it needs to produce the signal. And so if we just play this now, uh, it's, um, it's going to sound the same as it did before we added the envelope. Right? So we say, wait, hold on. We just added the envelope. Why is it not doing anything? The answer is that we've declared a variable and given it some content, but we have not incorporated the env into the signal processing algorithm. It's just sitting there doing its thing, making its signal, but it's not being applied. You know, it would, yeah, we, just, like, just like if we declared an amplitude argument, but then didn't actually use it here, it wouldn't do anything, right? So what we need to do is take this envelope signal and use it how we want to use it. And we are imagining it right now as being an amplitude modulator. So it's going to actually, you know, we're going to multiply this envelope signal by the signal that we want to hear. So that is as simple as just saying sig equals sig times env. Okay. And now, if we play this, we won't need this release anymore. Okay. There we go. And we can run this again. And we get the same thing. Maybe we want the attack to be quite a bit shorter really short, right, so almost instantaneous. So this is all good and well, but now I'm going to show you problem number one. If we open up the node tree with show node tree, this is a representation of the processes that are active on the server. And uh, let's put this over here and put this over here and run this again. Right? So we're just, we're just making these sounds, and to the human ear, they sound like they are totally, unambiguously finite. They go away, and they're gone, right? Well, no, they're not gone, because <clears throat> uh, this envelope signal, uh, w let's, actually, um, let's actually poll it. So we're gonna, polling is, is a relative of post-ln in that it shows us the value of something, but poll is for signals, and so we're going to actually be printing you know, con continuously values from this signal. So watch the post window when we run this. Right. And on it goes, right? Just because the value of a signal is zero does not mean SuperCollider is going to say, oh, this must be done. I'll turn it off, right? We have not given SuperCollider any instruction on what to do when the envelope finishes. And so it does nothing. So it just the envelope just keeps playing, just like a sine wave would, just like a pink noise generator would. It just, it's reached the end, it's reached its final value of zero, and so it just holds that value indefinitely. So as a result, all of these silent processes, even though they're silent, are still consuming processing power. They're still calculating all these values, which are eventually just wiped out as zeros, but, you know, a zero costs the same amount as a, a one or any other value on the server. So 
Um, so here's where we introduce the concept of, well, first we can just hit command period, right? And boom, they go away. So that's problem solved, sort of. Uh, and let's get rid of this poll. And uh, the other thing we really ought to put in this end gen is a done action. There's a bunch of things in the middle. There's a gate argument. There's ways to scale and shift the envelope values and also stretch them in time. Uh, and then there's a done action at the end. So I'm going to skip on ahead to, uh, sorry, that should be a capital A, done action. Now a done action is, well, ultimately it's just an integer, uh, which will be interpreted by SuperCollider as an action to take when the unit generator it belongs to is done. Now, some UGENs are never done, like a sine wave or a pink noise generator. There is no, there's no beginning, there's no end, it's just a generative process. But an envelope has a beginning and has an end. And done action is basically a flag, or, or it's a, when, when a, when a UGEN that is finite finishes, it will check its done action. Uh, so let's, let's see if we can find some sort of help. Uh, Got to find this here, done actions. Very difficult to find this one. Let's look at uh, end of gen. And let's see if it points us to, I, I think this is now in a help file called done, actually. Uh, and this is, this is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, end gen is one of several unit generators. Basically, anything which is envelope-like or something which plays a sound file is in this category because it's always going to be done at some point. Uh, and I think all the way at the bottom, we have a sort of older table of the names of a done action, the integer that identifies it, and then a description of what it does. There's 15, 16 of these, because they start at zero. And probably almost all of these are going to look like complete nonsense to you. And if that's, if that's true for you, then don't worry about it, because they almost look like nonsense to me sometimes. There's really only two done actions which are used. The rest, the rest of them are super fringe, as far as I can tell. I've been using SuperCollider for like more than 10 years. I've only ever used zero and two. Very occasionally I've used one. Um, so zero is the default for pretty much every done action. It, it means don't do anything. Um, and two is free the enclosing synth. And I think I introduced free last week, right? Just a hard stop on a synthesis process. So, uh, and one will pause it, which basically stops uh, it from consuming CPU cycles, but doesn't actually destroy it. So it's just like, I think a lot of tracks and some DAWs let you pause. It's kind of the same concept. So the, the track is still there, but it's inactive. Yeah, so uh, two is free self. So if we say um, two, uh, and then we look at the node tree again, it goes away, right? As soon as the UGen, the engine gets to the end of its shape, it says, okay, I'm gonna check my done action, two, got it, boof, and then off it goes. No more, no more synth. So now we can just run this code willy-nilly and we never have to worry about a bunch of synths accumulating. This is super important. Uh, this done class is, I think, kind of relatively new relative to the integer approach. I, you know, I, when I was learning SuperCollider, everything I saw was this integer approach. And this is not the greatest from, from the perspective of like, okay, two, what does that mean? Why would you, why would you know two is whatever? So, in the, in the done class, there's uh, methods which are meant to be more descriptive. So even, you can even do this outside of a um, UGEN function. This just returns the number two, right? It just quite literally evaluates to the number two. Um, like I think if you were to look in the source code, it would just be like, uh, yeah, it just, well, no, that's not, that's not is that it? I, it yeah, who cares, right? All you need to know is that this, this evaluates to two, and so you can just take this thing and put it here. It's more typing, but it, it's a lot more clear in, in like this UGEN's done action is to free itself when done. Very clear. You do whatever you want. I, in this class, if you want to do number two, I have no problem with that. Go for it. But you can also do it this way. Um, so this is the same idea. And so that's, that's all good and well. And let me see if I can squeeze in two more concepts here. One is the concept of re-triggerable envelopes, and the other is the concept of sustaining envelopes. <clears throat> and then in, <laughs> I'll try to use four minutes for that, and then one minute for synth and synth def. 
uh, which uh, synth incentive is a pretty pretty straightforward concept, and, and even if we don't get to it, I, you can you can read the book chapter on that. But it's it's just uh, okay. Uh, so um, let's let's make an envelope which is uh, super short. I'm going to run this at the you know, and I said I'd give you a, a syntax alternative for this, didn't I? So um, as as a shortcut for doing it this way, you can just make the env itself like this. Right? So we're saying, we're forgetting about mgen, we're just going to say in the ugen function, we're making this env, and then at the end of the env enclosure, we say dot kr or whatever we want. And this is a method which, when applied to env, produces an envgen. And the order of the arguments here is a little bit different. First comes the done action, and then the rest of them, gate and whatever. So, so we can just put a two here, or done dot free self, and this is the same thing. I, I've really grown to like this shortcut, and I use it almost exclusively. It does have the result of producing an engine, but you just don't have to write it out. Um, so that's, that's pretty handy. OK, so let's make a re-triggerable envelope. Uh, I'm going to make this nice and short. So now it's going to sound like this. Um, in fact, I'm going to, uh, wh when you play a ugen function this way, it introduces a 0 0.02 second fade in. So you actually, we're not actually hearing just how short this is, but we can override that by saying fade time 0 after the play message. Here it's a little bit more crisp there. If we, if we don't do the fade time, right, there's actually a, a secondary fade in which is superimposed over this. So, so we're just going to disable that for a second. Uh, so if we want to re-trigger this envelope, done action 2 is a bad choice. Because if it gets to the end, the synth disappears, and we have nothing left to talk to to re-trigger it. So we're going to change this 2 to a 0, which is the do nothing. And for the gate argument, now you can do this with either style, using ngen or using the env shortcut. Gate is a value which, when this value changes from non-positive to positive, it will, uh, I'm simplifying a little bit here, but it resets the envelope. It basically goes from its current value and then kind of begins anew, starting from wherever it happens to be. So I'm going to make an argument here called trig. And I'm going to do this the bad way first by making it control rate. And I'll set it initially to a value of 1. Right, so now we have this argument which um, we, can, we can talk to. We can sort of set it to 0 and then set it back to 1. So let's, let's watch what happens here. All right, so it plays. And it's not gone. It's still there because the done action is 0. But now we can set trig to be uh, well, we can't set it to 1 because it's already 1, right? So we're not actually changing the value. We have to set it to 0 and then set it to 1, and we can re-trigger the envelope. So basically, when you set this to any, any non-positive number, and then as soon as it becomes positive again, the, that's, that's a signal for this envelope to say, oh, here we go again, right? It goes through, goes through its uh, values one more time. But the... This was, a, this was a really early question I had, like, many years. It was one of the first things I encountered. I was like, this can't be right. We have to set it to 0 and then set it to 1. So the solution is to use a trigger type argument. So instead of .kr, .tr. Let me describe for you the behavior of trigger type arguments. They hold their value for one control cycle, which by default is 64 audio samples. And immediately after that cycle ends, they snap to zero. Right? And then you can set them to some other value again. And again, they will go to that value for exactly one control cycle, and then they snap back to zero. So this is really useful if you want a, an argument to behave like a trigger, where it just inputs that value for just a fraction of a second and then returns itself to a state where it's ready for more information. So this, this way, we can just run this as much as we want. Right? Even pretty fast, because 64 samples is uh, almost nothing. Right? So, so now we have this retriggerable envelope, and so you know, th this is just sort of nice, and that we can you know, uh, play a sound as often as we want. Let me, let me just um, uh, 
make these a little bit different. Um, so let's do this. Right, and then we can re-trigger it again. But the question is, what happens if we just sort of mash this trigger like faster than 2.5 seconds? Right. So here's what's happening here. Let me draw you a little quick picture here. Uh, so let's say we have we have this kind of simple shape here, which goes here and here, right? And so time moves this way. Uh, we, we give it an initial trigger, and it begins its shape. And uh, wherever the next trigger, ha let's say the next trigger happens to occur here, right? And we're at like, I don't know, 0.4 if this is 1 and this is 0, right? What happens, uh, what, what, we, what we don't want to happen is for this value to suddenly snap back to zero, because then we'll hear a click, we'll get this discontinuity. It's not what we want. So the default behavior is for you know, when, when, a, when an envelope signal is re-triggered, the signal goes from its current value to the value with index one, right? Not the beginning, but the very next one, starting at its current level and using the same interpolation. Yeah, so this is a nice design. Yeah, right. And so, so really, if you, if you re-trigger it here, it's just already at its current value, so it's just going to hold there. And if we go down here and we re-trigger it, then it's going to you know, have gone down a little bit, but then it's just going to slide right back up. And if we're down here or past this value, then you know, we're at zero, so it's going to start at its current value, which happens to coincide with the beginning of the envelope. So that's, that's the behavior of re-triggering envelope. It's, it's good to keep that in mind, and, and it's nice that it was designed in such a way so that we don't get a bunch of discontinuities everywhere. And let me see if I can uh, let's do uh, sustaining envelopes. There is a, a uh, well, let's get rid of this for a second. Uh, and in the env.new construction, there is a four, there's actually a couple more arguments. Uh, the fourth one is release node. Release node is an index into the levels array. And it identifies the level at which the envelope will sustain so long as the gate argument remains positive. So let's, let's do um, something like this. Let's add another level. Let's make this fast and then kind of a, a quarter second decay and then a long release. And then, uh, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't matter so much. We, we can play with the curves all we want. It's not really our focus right now. And so I want the envelope to sustain at point 2. In the levels array, that value has index 2. So release node 2. Okay, so that, that 2 points to this value here. And so we want a gate argument. There are lots of, there's a, there's a couple of good reasons why you should use the word gate here. Um, none of which I'm going to go into right now, but there's a bunch of mechanisms behind the scenes which expect there to be an argument in your amplitude envelope called gate, and it, doing so gives you access to a lot of infrastructure that makes your life a lot easier. So uh, we're going to call, we don't want a trigger type argument because we want to be able to set this gate to a positive value and keep it there. Trigger type arguments don't do that. They, they just snap back to zero immediately. That's going to be very useless to us in this particular case. So whenever the gate value is positive, the envelope will progress and hold at its release, note, release node for as long as that gate remains positive. When gate becomes non-positive, it will continue on its merry way to the end, at which point it will check its done action, which in this case happens to be zero. Okay, so we get our... ADSR kind of thing we're sustaining now. And now if we set gate to be zero, I've done something wrong here. I, maybe, hold on, let me. Okay, I messed something up and I'm trying to figure out what I did. 
This is probably it. Nope. Hmm. I'm going to have to look into why <laughs> the named control, you know, version does not, does, there's a, I'm sure there's a very logical reason, but the, the, the core of it, I think, is, as you'll understand when we get to synth and synth def, this function.play construction is doing a lot of things in the background. It's a convenience. And you can see just from all the synths we're making that it's, it's doing the work for us in the background and making a bunch of substitutions and additions to make sure that this works. So uh, I'll try to come back to you with, a, with an explanation for why that was the solution. But for now, now this, this, this works now. Because you can hear we have our attack, our decay, we sustain at the release node, we set the gate to zero, fades out over two seconds. Because the done action is, you know what, I have two of these here, just for clarity, I'm going to kill them and do this again. Okay. So we fade, and because the nut action is zero, we can set this to one, and we can re-trigger or restart the envelope. If the done action, which we can make an argument for, were two, so here it's, here it's zero. Oh, sorry, set it to zero. Right. So now if we set the done action, uh, well, actually, let's do it this way. Uh, turn it back on. And then another set message, which zeroes the gate and sets the done action to be two. Now watch the node tree over here. Now, and now this won't do anything. Right, right. right. So we, we can send a set message to a thing, but the server says, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no, nobody lives here. So, uh, all right. Very quickly, if you will indulge me, synth and synth def, try to keep this as simple as possible. Uh, when we function dot play, a synth def, which is a, a set of instructions for creating a sound or a signal, is created for us. And also a synth, which is the execution of that synth def, is, is created for us. So this function dot play is a convenience in a, in a lot of different ways. It automatically adds an envelope, which is what allows us to use release, and which is why we have this 0 0.02 second fade in. It also gives the synth a temporary name. That's these names you've been seeing here, temp, underscore, underscore, whatever. Uh, so let's, let, let me just show you the process of creating a synth def from a function.play. It's a three-step process. Number one, uh, well, the, well, the construction begins with uh, let's, let's do it this way. Uh, we are going to make a synth def dot new. Right. Step one, uh, we need to give this synth def a name. Anybody? What's a good name for this? It can be silly. I don't care. Eli. Okay, Eli. <laughs> okay, it's it's named me. So then, so we give it a name, which is usually a symbol. A string is also fine, I think, but I usually use symbols. And then we just need to dump the ugen function in as the second item. So comma after the name, and then paste, okay? So step one, give it a name. Step two, explicitly designate a signal to be output. Now, most but not all synth defs actually output a signal, something you want to hear, right? This one does. There are others, like ones which record data into a, into a, into a buffer, like to you know, record a mic signal or something. That one might not actually have an output, but most of the ones we do, they, most of the ones we make, they do have an output. And so we're going to use an output unit generator called out.ar. Out needs two things. It needs to know where to send a signal and what signal to send. So um, we can make an output uh, argument here. In many, many cases, uh, zero will correspond to your lowest numbered hardware output. If you're using your built-in speakers, it's going to be your left speaker. If you're using headphones, it's going to be your left headphone cup or whatever. 
Uh, if you have an audio interface, it's going to be the lowest numbered jack on the back of that. And, you know, you get the idea. Um, and then we want to say SIG is the thing I want you to write to that destination. And SIG is a two-channel signal because we've used multi-channel expansion. But you should never specify an array of outputs for out because the behavior is that, you know, if we send a multi-channel signal to a single output destination, Super Collider will automatically write the subsequent channels to subsequent outputs. So that means this stereo signal, SIG, will get written to 0 and 1. That's what we want. Finally, and this is very important, we must add the synth def. This, is a, this add message does a bunch of magic stuff, builds the, what's called the ugen graph function, packages it, sends it over to the server using OSC messages, and the server says, great, gotcha, I now know how to Eli. Fantastic. So we run this. There we go. It says a synth def, that's what we want to see. And then we can say synth uh, Eli. And there's no dot play needed here. We just, I guess officially we should say dot new. You'll find that in a lot of cases, dot new can just be omitted. And you don't need it. And Super Collider will figure it out. Right. And we didn't give it a name, so we can't really talk to it. Um, so we're just going to say <laughs> command period here. We'll just, we'll just remove that. But we can say x equals and then x dot free. And you'll notice that release now doesn't work. Doesn't do it. Because when we function.play, secretly, invisibly, an envelope is created and, and scaled by whatever the last expression is, and it has an argument named gate, and release is a convenience method which, in the background, sends a gate zero message. So with the synth def approach, what you see is what you get. So if you don't put an output ugen in here, you won't hear anything because nothing is being output. Right? It's, uh, if, you, if, you, if I give this a different name, Eli2, right? doppelganger Eli, and I don't add this synth def, and I try to play Eli2, it says Eli2 not found, because there can be only one. Well, not, not really. There can be multiple Eli synth defs. Just, you know what I mean. The, so, so you have to add. have to add the synth def. And, of course, the name is important, because we need to be able to say, play this synth def, the one named Eli, or whatever. Um, but pretty much everything else we've covered here, envelopes and arguments, applies. You know, you can use different argument styles. I'm still a little puzzled about this, this weird thing with the um, uh, envelope not working correctly. But I think that's a consequence of using function.play and having a, a second envelope secretly added. And that was messing things up. In fact, I, I think I, I do understand now. It's because there is a default fade time of 0 0.02, which was being applied when I set the gate to 0. And that was cutting off the longer decay. Yeah, OK. All right, sorry to run a little bit long, but um, that wraps up chapter two. Uh, you should have everything you need to finish uh, homework two. I think what I'm going to do is very selectively pick through chapter three next, just kind of talk about filters. But I'm going to encourage you to just kind of skim as your curiosity takes you through chapter three. And instead, we're going to turn most of our attention to chapter four which is sampling. So dealing with audio files and playing them back and manipulating them. Because right now we've been just doing like oscillators and noise generators and SuperCollider's got a lot of fun tools for, for, for uh, file playback as well. So get cracking on that homework. Take a look at it sooner rather than later. And uh, let, let me know if you have any questions. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>